I want to carry on the uh, Conservative Party leadership uh, story a little bit with, uh, with this from Rishi Sunak, because um, I find it incredible that these people could resign on principle. This is Rishi Sunak's resignation letter. You can't read it. It's too small. I'm just showing you that it's on headed paper. But within that um, letter, this is, a, this is one of the paragraphs that he's, he's put on there. Uh, in preparation for our proposed joint speech on the economy next week, it has become clear to me that our approaches are fundamentally different. So he's he's saying that he's resigning because of a particular reason that happened this week or last week. Uh, but then when you look at um, this uh, investigation that someone found, uh, he has actually um, registered uh, for readyforishicomp.com website in December uh, last year. So he's been looking at becoming ready for Rishi for quite a while. And similarly, uh, how would someone who's on principle resigning just because of something in the last week produce a video of this kind of caliber uh, within two days? Someone has to grip this moment and make the right decisions. That's why I'm standing to be the next leader of the Conservative Party and your Prime Minister. I want to lead this country in the right direction. I ran the toughest department in government during the toughest times when we faced the nightmare of COVID. My values are non-negotiable. Patriotism, fairness, hard work. Well, I... Uh... You know, I, I can't stand dishonest uh, politicians. Just like I probably don't, I don't quite, I don't really like Keir Starmer's dishonesty. Tony, he's he's great, but that's that's just as bad. Um, and uh, Ben Timberley is 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 on the call. Ben, how are you doing? Oh, not so bad, sir. Yourself? I'm good. Rishi Sunak's definitely been planning this for some time, and uh, doesn't doesn't isn't that going to put people off that? that he's kind of not being honest about what he's doing. I, I think it is, but he's not the only one that's been doing it. I mean, um, Sunak has been planning this for roughly a year. Patel has been um, planning hers for at least two years that we can tell. Zahawi has hired a team for at least the past nine months. They've all been at it. They've all been you know, squirreling away resources and building their support platforms and their campaign platforms and their teams to make this happen in readiness for the day that Boris would be replaced. And bear in mind, this isn't, uh, you know, he hasn't resigned. This isn't a, a uh, sort of an election. This is a replacement succession. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the 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 way the media is talking about it is it's all to do with uh, uh, the guy groping and Boris Johnson lying and uh, and that's it. And and it, the succession of resignations has just been on on the back of that, not a plot. I mean, no one, as far as I can see in the media, has said this. If you go and look at Sky, BBC, any of them, they're not saying that. So um, what I would what I'd like to know, Ben, is have you been looking behind? the Tories at all. <laughs> I have, I have. I, I flipped the format on its head for you, Crispin. J just for this one-off special, uh, I thought I'd take a look at what's going on behind the Tories because it is so similar to what uh, has been going on behind Labour that it absolutely needs to be reported and we need to understand what's going on. So without well, further well, I'll, ado... I'll leave, you, I'll leave you to it. Right. Bless you. Very kind, sir. Right, I'm just going to share this screen uh, and I'm going to um, ask for um, your feedback to make sure you can see it. Can you see this, Crispin? Quick thumbs up. Good stuff. OK, so today we're going to talk about the ERG, which is the European Research Group. Now, many of you who are policy wonks and political um, you know, uh, followers will be aware of the ERG as having been floating around since uh, the, the John Major days. Um, originally started out as a sort of a think tank, like a, a little grouping of nerds uh, who thought that Europe was terrible and they wanted Britain out of it. Uh, you know, they, they never really got over Maastricht and everything else. So they're, they're looking for, you know, ways of, of, of getting, um, you know, the UK to be its own independent imperial body once again. And I've got some bad news. Whether Johnson stays or goes, the ERG will most likely remain in charge. I'm positing a theory that the ERG have effectively been running the UK since the end or you know, since the middle of the, uh, the May premiership. Let's find out more. 
So the European Research Group is a research support group of Eurosceptic Conservative members of Parliament. The journalist Sebastian Payne described it in the Financial Times as the most influential research group, <laughs> research group in recent political history, serving an annual average of 21 MPs, including cabinet members. The group's focus is the single issue of the UK's withdrawal from the European Union. Now, in other um, slides on here, you'll see that actually the number is much higher in terms of the MPs that are involved in this and the people that are either sort of floating around it as satellites or, you know, just getting involved from a distance. On the left, you'll see the, the various chairs that have been involved. So Steve Baker, Suella Braverman, Jacob Rees-Mogg, uh, Marc Francois, um, you know, <laughs> and you know, Bernard Jenkin and various other people. So you'll notice that there's names that you recognise there. On the right, you'll also see a long list of the people that are we're pretty sure are members of the ERG. This is the party within a party inside the Tory party um, that essentially hoovered up a lot of the support ideas and agenda of UKIP when UKIP collapsed um, and have continued to push that agenda inside the Tory party. So I won't hover on this for too long. There are many more names associated with the ERG inside the Tory party. As you can see here, these are people that have signed things in support of ERG policies, ERG IDs, ideas. And you'll notice on here, there's <laughs> some of the more interesting personalities uh, in the Tory party, the ones that everybody looks at and goes, are you serious? Are you actually an MP? Um, yeah, and these are people that you know, generally we stay away from. And as you can see, there are some that have been in the headlines recently, such as Andrea Jenkins, um, who was recently uh, sort of uh, flipping the bird to uh, people that she didn't like very much. Um, you know, my <laughs> former MP, um, well, my current MP, uh, Andrew Bridgen, and you know, my former MP, uh, uh, where's he gone? Philip Hollabone is in there as well. Yeah, and these are all people that are well known as being a bit out there in the Tory movement. Now, Open Democracy have been investigating the ERG for a long time. Um, they basically concluded this. It's essentially a, a think tank group that is funded by the MPs themselves within Parliament. So what, what they basically do is they say, OK, I'm going to um, pay this all party group, if you like, to do research for me as an MP. Therefore, it goes on my expenses. So they claim this money back as expenses against their parliamentary figures, which means that it is entirely funded by Parliament. Let that sink in. <laughs> it's essentially a, a nasty little tumour that's come off the Houses of Parliament that essentially controls our government as it currently stands. On here, as you can see, it says the ERG, according to its current chair, and this was uh, a while back when this was uh, printed, as you can see, this is 2017. Um, Suela Fernandez, otherwise known as Suela Braverman, interesting that uh, you know, they used her uh, maiden name here, exists to ensure that Brexit will not be rendered meaningless. The group regarded as an 80 strong private uh, Tory caucus wants Britain out of the EU single market and customs union. Its previous head, Steve Baker, we'll come on to him in a minute, now minister in the department for exiting the um, European Union, which uh, was until recently Michael Gove's department, said his group aimed to end EU's despotism, give Britain back its borders. 40 MPs have paid money to the ERG and claimed it back as research over the period covering the David Cameron and Theresa May governments. These include current ministers and members of May's cabinet as it stood, as it stood back then. The true number could be higher. According to a Whitehall analyst who, who reviewed MPs' expenses for, um, for open democracy, the amount of taxpayers' money received by the ERG is likely to be well above the officially listed quarter of a million quid. That's a lot of cake. A lot okay that buys you an awful lot of favors and a lot awful lot of um you know staff research capability invites to posh expensive meetings all the things you need to control a government and bear in mind this was back in 2017 so open democracy also looked into the ties between the erg and the us now this is where things get really interesting yeah, Crispin, I'm sure you'll have come across Mr. John Bolton before, the, the official war hawk of the Trump government. This guy you know, was responsible for all kinds of horrendous statements about um, you know, uh, foreign nationals, about minorities, about the use of chemical weapons. He even went to the point of basically getting uh, the head of the uh, International uh, Chemical Weapons Inspectorate fired 
from his position because he dared to push an agenda that would hold America accountable for its chemical we weapons program that it allegedly doesn't have. He's a nasty piece of work. And it's interesting because according to this, the ERG have been having private discussions with Mr. Bolton and various other people like him. A small group on the libertarian and neurosceptic right of British politics, i.e. the ERG, has long looked to the US for inspiration. These transatlantic connections grew and strengthened rapidly away from the public view in the years before and after the EU referendum. A network of pro-Brexit politicians, journalists and lobbyists pushed for the UK to move away from the European regulation and towards the US. I can't understate how important that section is. The UK has been peeled away from the EU and the social and economic um, constraints that the EU has to make it fall in line and in lockstep with US policy, both social, domestic, economic and foreign policy. All of these areas, we have started becoming essentially a satellite state of the US. And the reason I think they want to do that is because they want to see an end to the EU because they see the EU as essentially being too porous and too sympathetic to Russian interests and Chinese interests and others, and not uh, in favor enough of US interests. It is a classic US foreign policy ploy. They deployed the same tools that have proved so successful inside the Beltway for decades, relentlessly on message think tanks and academics funded by corporate donors, Paul Mason, hello. <laughs> Well-organized AstroTurf groups, you know, uh, the campaign for countering digital hate, hello. You know, um, designed to look like grassroots supporters and crucially, small, highly organized groups of influential politicians such as the ERG. Remember the comments we made about the OODA loops and the um, sort of military style intelligence communications programs we mentioned before? That's where all of this fits. This is the story of how a fringe conservative party pressure group was transformed into a highly disciplined secretive party within a party that changed the course of British politics and how taxpayer money, anonymous private donations and, high, and a high bound uh, parliamentary system helped them do it. So in short, they've imported the American model of politics using journalists or client media, using uh, academics you know, to astroturf and give legitimacy to their message, um, highly organized, privately funded covert operations using uh, politicians and intelligence and lobbying personnel to craft viral messages put into our brains via social media, relentless TV messaging, all on point. They've been doing this for years and it works in the, in the US and it works over here as Brexit proved. Now, what they've basically done, and this is interesting as well, it shows the ERG was taken over as an already existing vehicle. It morphed into a no-deal Brexit sect. Now, we've covered extensively the Labour Together movement you know, and various other um, Labour uh, organisations. Existing organisations that have been taken over by foreign interests, foreign money to be used for other purposes. We see the same strategy being used uh, inside Labour as we uh, are seeing here deployed effectively within the ERG. It's scary stuff. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. Steve Baker, this is the guy to watch in this election. My theory is, and I'm, I'm almost, not quite, but almost willing to put money on this, Whoever Steve Baker comes out and endorses will be the person that will win the leadership election. That is my prediction. Steve Baker basically used to be the head of the ERG. He headed it up through um, the Brexit referendum period. He's the guy that built it into this machine that it is. Uh, as you can see here, it basically means that he, um, where, where am I gonna look? Where am I gonna read from? Um, yeah, so Baker led the taxpayer funding ERG group of pro-Brexit MPs until being appointed a minister in 2017. So he had to, in theory, step down from his job as the head of this group so he could become a minister. But he never really gave up control. Uh, while in office, he offered to address the ERG privately on government policy. So this secretive group, you know, funded by you know, God knows who, organised by God knows who, getting private information, backdoor information on government policy all about Brexit, worth a huge amount of Wonga if disseminated to the right people. These briefings were not recorded in transparency data from um, DEXU uh, department uh, materials. So in short, it was all done completely off book. Um, and official rules bar ministers from being associated with non-public organizations who objectives may in any degree conflict with government policy. And uh, we've all seen the wrangling between the, uh, the Brexit department and the rest of the government on multiple occasions. And you know, it ultimately uh, resulted in Michael Gove's sacking and the fact that you know, he has, essentially his department was erased. All of the people that he put in place are gone. That department was gutted. 
So, um, in short, Steve, Steve Baker um, has been continually involved in this. And I have heard rumours, albeit um, sly rumours, that Steve Baker may be looking to stand in the leadership contest, which would explain a lot of what has been going on. An investigation by Open Democracy re revealed how Baker continued to meet with and influence the ERG after he was appointed as a minister in the DEXU department. There it goes, straight up. Now, this is where most of my work went into on this uh, beautiful, beautiful document. I've listed all of the candidates that are currently known to be standing or have stood down in this campaign. Uh, ben Wallace, uh, uh, Corbs' mate, <laughs> allegedly <laughs> he's too nice for the leadership you know he can't stand he's decided he doesn't want to get involved with this uh, and you know <laughs> i'm sure the first question he would be asked is you know how's your old mate uh, old mucker jez he's said nice things about jeremy corbyn which automatically excludes him from leading the tory party he's just a thoroughly nice bloke by all accounts but in short um rishi rishi sunak is the banker's candidate you know he is the guy the money guy he is the person that um the financial industry would be happy to back because he would act as their front man parroting their interests you know liz truss um re widely regarded as completely clueless and incompetent you know um she has been the victim or the perpetrator depends how you look at it of multiple multiple car crash interviews so she, she doesn't stand a cat in hell's chance of actually getting this leadership contest in her favor uh sajid javid uh, i think he's an extra from the film june you know one of the harkonnen stormtroopers a bit of a scary um, fella you know he's got absolutely nothing working in his favor as far as i can tell you know again uh, from their uh, party insider he's he's seen as being incompetent and boring and wooden you know the briefing you know he's uh, the briefing against him is working. He has no communications capacity and uh, a poor team built up around him. So I don't think he stands a chance. Nadim Zahawi, as Jackie was saying, you know, the identity politics works in his favour in a big way. And he has some seriously powerful people on his team. You know, he, he set up businesses <laughs> selling Teletubby merchandise. <laughs> you couldn't make it up. <laughs> but he's also a frontman for various weapons dealing companies and arms companies as well in various different capacities. And he's also a member of an organisation called Le Circle. And nobody really knows what Le Circle is. It's um, a, a very shadowy group of um, cross-party uh, MPs. So uh, I know that several Labour MPs are involved. Um, you know, a certain Dame Mar Margaret Beckett, amongst others, has been recipient of payments from them uh, for trips and expenses and things like that. So Le Circle appears to be a very unusual, and I would class it as dodgy organization. And he is one of the, the key people inside that. So he's definitely the sort of the Warhawks candidate. He's the person who wants to see more war, more war in the world and benefit from it and profit from it. That's my view. Jeremy Hunt, um, he's been hiding in a cupboard, I think, for some, some time now. Um, ever since he was absolutely humiliated by, by Boris Johnson, I've heard rumours that he's been putting a vengeance campaign together to stand as leader and to try and win. And he has got some significant support. So I can't discount Jeremy Hunt. Uh, but all I'll say is if he comes across with a PPE sales pitch, I'm going to have to say no, because it, it, it chances are it's probably a bucket load of dodgy masks from Turkey that were already rejected by the NHS. Do your own research on that. It's a great story. Um, Suella Braverman, um, she likes to be called Suella rather than her real name, which is Sue Ellen. I'm sure that's got nothing to do with listings on Companies House at all. I'll say no more. Um, she's not a QC. So although she is the attorney general, she isn't a legal professional. And... She has defended the use and she has used the phrase herself and defended the use of the phrase of cultural Marxist, which, as we all know, is a rather nasty anti-Semitic trope. And it's not something that any you know, a sensible political person, activist or anybody above should be using. Yet she's used it and she's defended using it. That tells you a lot about Suella Braverman. Um, Penny Morden. She's the official dark horse in this. She's just thrown her hat in the ring today for the leadership contest. She's definitely one to watch. Um, she has got some chops. She's got a good team around her. And most of all, she's kept quiet for quite a long time. Out of all of the ones here, she is the one I think that is going to pull out some secret weapon here uh, and could actually make a serious play for this. Plus, she's a woman. You know, it, it, it needs, it doesn't, you know, it shouldn't need to be stated that, you know, we need more women in politics, we, we need more representation. And as Jackie was saying, the ID uh, politics card is heavy to play here. Now you'll notice there's one set I've marked up as ERG, 
These are the ones that are proven to be ERG members or affiliates. Um, you know, uh, Kemi Badenoch at the bottom, she's kind of sort of in outish with ERG, but at least half of the candidates here are ERG affiliated which shows you just how um, seriously problematic the ERG has become within the Tory party. Um, you know, ben Wallace has uh, stepped out. Tom uh, Tugendat, he is a former intelligence officer in the uh, armed forces. You know, he's uh, been uh, through the, uh, the territorial army and various other things. You know, the guy is seriously connected. You know, he does consulting, all sorts of stuff on the side. You know, He's essentially the intelligence organization's candidate. He's the military industrial complex's intelligence hatted man. He's got all the clearance. He knows all, uh, where all the skeletons are buried. And he's also been uh, one of the few people that has been successfully able to stand up to the ERG. So he is a non-ERG candidate. And aside from Rishi, and, uh, Rishi Sunak, I think he's probably the only other person that stands a serious chance of actually winning this uh, um, election. And I seriously think uh, we need to pay him more attention because you know he has he has popped up in all the wrong places. Uh, he's definitely a war hawk. He's definitely in favour of American foreign policy. Priti Patel, um, we know that she's the Hindutva candidate, so she's associated with the BJP in India. She supports their policy. She's a big fan of Narendra Modi, and as we've seen, you know, uh, what's happening in India, it's not a pretty picture. Her politics are appalling. And I think she, out of everybody on here, she's the candidate that scares me the most. So again, we've got to watch her because you know she's already launched a campaign. She's going to be going hard on this. Whether she's actually interested in taking the top job or not, I'm not sure. It might be that she's running as a faller, as, as what's known as a stalking horse for other candidates. Uh, Grant Shap, he likes playing with trains. <laughs> yeah, that's all I'm going to say about Grant Shapps. Um, he's viewed widely as a bit of a joke candidate. And then Kemi Bardnock, um, who is essentially a culture warrior. You know, she is of the Trumpist ilk. She wants, you know, she wants to defend uh, white people's privileges to say this, that, and the other. All sorts of, you know, just nutty things that she's come out with that, frankly, don't belong in British politics. But then much of this doesn't belong in British politics. You know, much of this is directly imported from the American playbook, the Republican playbook, which is scary because we've got the left, uh, the right wing of the Democrats invading the Labour Party. We've got the um, Republicans invading the Tory party. The UK is set for a titanic battle between the foreign agency arms of the Democrat and Republican parties, where lots and lots of collateral damage is going to be done because it doesn't matter what happens over here in terms of uh, civil unrest and social unrest to the Americans. They're way over there, over the other side of the pond. So we've got some big problems appearing here. And just as a couple of final points on this, um, if you notice Boris Johnson having a weird, odd reshuffle, you know, when he's supposed to be resigning, which just frankly didn't make sense, now it does. It's a great way to be able to throw people a bung, a huge wad of cash for whatever favours done publicly or privately to the people that he put into ministerial positions who lasted just a couple of days. The rules basically say that if you've held that position for less than three months, you must get a payoff for three months. It's severance. Um, now, um, to be fair to her, Michelle Donnellan, uh, featured in this headline, has said that she would give that sum to charity because she didn't know that that was a thing, which showed her inexperience as an MP. But the others that have been put into those positions will know about this so whether boris has been using this as a bung system or not remains to be seen but it looks really bad and finally <laughs> the current the current chair of the erg is none other than mr mark francois <laughs> so all hands on dick um deck um, said a Tory MP, the, as the Express understands, they were still talking about the leadership contest. The ERG are maintaining their Brexit stick to continue to control government policy. As this article points out, the next Tory leader must be a Brexiteer, senior Tory MPs have said, as those vying for the top job begin to launch the campaigns. ERG Chair Chairman Mark Francois told Express... The decision on Boris's success will rightfully rest with our party members, but given the great struggle to achieve Brexit since 2016, I'd be very surprised if they picked anyone who everyone knows is still a devoted Remainer at heart, which basically spells out that ERG are in charge. We are confident that we are in charge. We are not worried about any challenge from any other section. We are going to make this work. And if you all cast your mind back to the grey zone reports that we've recently shared and we've done some work on investigating, you'll notice that Sir Richard Dearlove, the former MI6 head, otherwise known as C, 
was working with Priti Patel and others in the ERG group to put in place the hardest Brexit they could for various nutty reasons, you know, including imperialism and you know the British legacy and you know making a bucket load of money for their American donors. But the point being, they've got some serious people working alongside them in the intelligence community and elsewhere, and we've got to pay close attention to all of them. That's me done for now. Thanks, Crispin.